So tonight, our first reader is Mary Flanagan. And Mary is the Sherman Fairchild Distinguished Professor in um, Digital Humanities at Dartmouth, which I didn't even know there was a Digital Humanities <laughs> Department. Well, there um, isn't. <laughs> okay. um, she is also the founding director of Tilt, Tilt, Fact, can't say this, Tilt Factor Lab, which is an interdisciplinary innovation studio that designs and studies games with, so, with social impact. And in fact, several years ago when, um, I can't remember the name of the game, first came out, I contacted your group. It's, it's a fascinating game. And uh, well, Ghost Sentence is here is her first book of poetry. It's actually her sixth published book um, that include the acclaimed critical play from MIT Press and also a book called Values at Play in Digital Games, which she co-wrote also from MIT. Um, and she is the recipient of numerous fellowships and has exhibited artwork at the Whitney Museum of American Art and the Guggenheim. And I think the key word for this introduction is interdisciplinary. Our second reader is Sarah Dickinson Snyder, who is also an educator, recently retired from head of school position and teaching English at middle schools, mostly Massachusetts, but also Colorado, California, New Hampshire. And uh, she travels very widely, which I learned while trying to set up this event, and she was <laughs> in Vietnam with a group. Um, she's attended Red Loaf Writers Conference and other workshops, and uh, 2017 was a big year for Sarah, as two of her poetry collections were published last year. Uh, Notes from a Nomad, which is a chapbook which draws on her global travel experiences, and Human Contract, which is an examination of her life path. So without further ado, please help me welcome Mary Flanagan. Thank you so much. <clears throat> One moment. How's that? It seems like it's good. All right. Thank you very much for the warm invitation. And um, I'm, I'm happy to do a reading in my home, home turf. This is exciting. I live in Hanover. You have the better side. <laughs> I think so. So I'm going to do some um, some readings from Ghost Sentence, and then I, I thought, since uh, since this is a socially aware crowd in Norwich, I thought I would do uh, a little piece that I uh, put together of computational writing. So I. I use the computer in my writing practice. I, I start on paper, but then I often work, I, I, I consider it a collaboration with the computer. So it's this um, constant process for me of going back and forth and kind of, and, and making language strange again for myself. So um, I draw a lot upon the, uh, the traditions of ULIPO and other kind of experimental forms. So. Um, I use processes that maybe do word replacements or use algorithms to generate new writing from my own writing. So many of the poems uh, that I work with are following that formal experimentation, but I'm not using one form of experimentation in the whole book. I'm using a variety of, of them. So, uh, and I could probably talk to you about that. I also use a lot of translation. I'll run a poem through a translation software and then uh, to, let's just say, Icelandic. Then I'll run Icelandic back to Vietnamese. Then I'll run. So, so I, I'm constantly moving my language around in order for my, for, for, in order for me to, at, at simultaneously distance myself from my own language and then kind of discover new things. And that's one of the things I really like about working in the digital form is that sense of surprise. It's also something that happens in games. Um, as a game designer, you know, what people, you have a set of rules, but what people do with those rules is something else. And so, um, so that always fascinates me. So that said, um, the majority of this book was written after the uh, inauguration uh, of our current president, and uh, it just kind of poured out in about two months. So it was a very kind of intensive uh, period of writing that generated this, uh, this particular uh, particular set of poems, and um, there are a few that are old, older, uh, one or two, and I'll, I'll end with a poem that's actually from 2006 that seems highly relevant, um, uh, strangely prescient, I think. Um, so I'll just start off with uh, a poem called Election. Election. 
The lady in the video turns both hands and wrenches them like she's killing a chicken. She's sitting in front of a cheap copied landscape painting. Her hands enact a moment not as picturesque as the story of Mount Monadnock, how 400 million years ago wolves dug and dug, digging back dirt to make a hill so high even Emerson would call it a titan. Yet heavens, he did have his high hopes smashed, finding but a beggar wading through the trails, men of bone lashed to an old gas lamp post, unreasoned. The river no longer needs a guardian. They say it's a kind of abuse that sticks with you like a thorn in the paw. Actually, my first entry to New Hampshire was uh, do, being a resident at the McDowell Colony. Lo and behold, I live here now. Wow, there, I mean, it was close. <clears throat> Here's a, a poem called Love and Guns. Yes, I see the strangeness of it, how we thrive among hard-pressed metal, how I write to you the longest letters and elegant penmanship as though ink jots from my teeth. Each gun eats metal meat for jaundice. Is it because every blood-filled body hides a bucket of hate in the lungs? So breathing naturally labors under the pressure that pushes like magnets against the puned, the pure, pure love. This is the poem from, uh, the, from the title. <clears throat> I don't know how to exp explain this, so I'm just going to read it. <laughs> Since foxes believe that the world furs around them, they think they can feed reality. No one should use words for questions, even though foxes know that what they're writing or saying is barking the truth. We are nocturnal. Ghosts fill our lungs and hold our hands at night. Giggles fill our lutes and hold our handguns at streetlight. To see an apparition, you need to look up. Lead your giraffe by stalking the stars. Read a ghost sentence by watching the sky. And um, this was actually inspired, the, this idea of the ghost sentence was inspired by this moment. I used to live in the West Village in New York and one day I left my apartment and looked up and, and there was writing in the sky. Uh, it, was a, it was a Jenny Holzer project and um, that she was using a, a planes to write words in the sky as clouds. It was very amazing. So we'll get back to that theme later on. <clears throat> this is a poem called Mattering. God can see a dash rot on a black soul, on a black nightmare, but the figure lives in a large white house. Pale skin billowing, palms palpitating around the cars in the parking lot. Skin color here is tied to cruelty, crusade. Brothers scream from bruises and cry for justice. The gods and devils must hear our cudgels. You laugh in the devil's face law in the, do in the blonde devil's factor. Nonetheless, he or she vocabularies, visits, and stays. Like a friend who lost a shit job and didn't have a plan B. But in this case, the devil needs no diagnosis. This is a poem taken actually from uh, the current administration's re-election campaign website. That changed a little bit in my language, but you'll 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 find you'll find some similarities in the uh, in the little donation list. <clears throat> All right, which issues? Demons and scurvy will relentlessly attack us. The men say, lie about us, divide the rats. These next four years, we are asked the following questions: Which issues ultimately influence your decisions? 
Select as many as apply. Illegal immigrationing, radical Islamic terrorismos, the supremacy court, economy jobs outscourging, barter honchos, scarcity of life, Obama playing cards, religious libel, veteran culinary habits, taxation without representation, debit cards, other. Note that 75% of each contribution will be designated not towards these issues, but towards either the 2020 primary, which shall be the default, or the 2020 election fund party. <laughs> the original name of this book uh, was actually called Fascist Love Song. Um, my editor thought that was too political, considering the, con the overall tone of the book. I thought it was pretty good, but anyway. <laughs> this is fascist love song. You can decide. I plight alligators to the flamethrower of the united fascettes of Unimagica, and to the repulsion for which it stands, one navel going under, without rescue, with kafefe and justifications, U-Haul. <laughs> And the last poem I'm going to read from, from this book is a long one. Um, but then it'll be followed up by some short and sassy things. So bear with me through the, through, the, through the tirade. Or I shall say the, the essay. <clears throat> Today I finish ghost sentence with leaving. I have trouble staying and going, trouble making decisions since things went south. Maybe in the woods. I should go high in the woods. I should go north to the woods. Woods are good, good in summer and lonely in the winter. Islands. Bugs are always busy, and I will be too. I should forage, hide from the cameras. Just when I try to call home, home is somewhere I must leave. This is the right property for you, she said, the right property. How can she possibly know? How can she possibly know? Who knows what the right house is? Who knows what the right job is or the most perfect shoes? Which choices avoid plastic, silver halide, mercury? Which is the better love? Whose country loves more art? What language has 31 words for snow? Which brand of toothpaste from the hundreds of brands of toothpaste lined up on the pharmacy shelves? Which one, which one? Mean. You were mean. Mean and taught me not to know. Mean and conniving America, endless toothpaste for pickety smiles, endless dental bounty, endless promises and paper towels, endless end tables and frozen dinners, endless toilet paper, too much choice America, too much time spent choosing. How to tell what road America, the righteous path? How could she possibly know the right land? How could she possibly know the right town? Did she walk the magic rice paper for deeper insight, America? The pale belly of the power plant spits open to spew brown blood. Kimosabe, what have you done with my horse? Where is my mask and my gun? My confusion is mundane. My confusion is mundane. She thinks I am an artist and I am merely mundane. I need to pretend. Pretend that no one thinks about the brand of toilet paper. Pretend that toilets do not defecate Miami and Venice. Play deaf. Each phone to shining phone, drone to drone, from each drone the brand of toilet paper lurks imminent. Men advise women. Women call their mothers. From shelves to shining shelves of toilet America, trees surrender their rings America. My father hocked his wedding ring for toilet paper and an alarm clock. After the war, after the war, after the pool has dried, make another. Here we are, another war, this time inside. Our toilet speaks priorities. Birds cough out their lungs, fly with regret to places where their feet no longer freeze in ice. Birds start falling. Bees lie dying. Men make people into blood across the sea, bringing the bottles home with them. Newspapers, how can you possibly know what to print? How can anything precede anything? When, are, when you are accused of untruth, then who owns actuality? How can you pair of shoes justify your going on sale? Who exactly is making shoes and typing and answering phones? Phoenix, phoenixing from the excess I look down, from the spectacle I look down, all of my waste are cellophane. When confronted I look down, I look down, I look down and see how friendly concrete is. 
how friendly concrete likes to grow and cover. Hold me concrete, your arms are warm and breathe summer. I look down and watch a falling baby hit its head and thunk. It is crowded and I do not know which road. Did she say left? Whose shame is this? I am lonely and I do not know which toothpaste. We are either watchers getting fat or doers starving and dying. We are alone. I look down. Baby, how can you give me your secret book of lizards? Keep them close. Keep your fingers. Fingers and mouth and point. Pointing at something makes it real. Way anchor, baby. Here comes the water. And there is blood staining the street, blood staining the teeth. Feet push platforms to be above water. Skin stretches marked from pain to be real. Pain in the low hum of refrigerators I can hear crying softly in every kitchen in this city. When refrigerators cry, lights hum, a monk drone of pity. Lights have pity and refrigerators lie. The baby closes its book and cries. Toothpaste falls to the concrete and cries. I look down. How the people are sighing. How they wail in raided restaurants in the night and sent away. Who's shame? Don't tell me you aren't listening. The city is leaving. The big one is leaving. A man in a ratty gorilla suit exits his 10th Street apartment. My stacks of postmodernist criticism are post-leaving. No one knows where they will shelter. My laundry is leaving, dark shrubs shuffling down the stairs. You're leaving me in the pools of blood the men brought bottled home. You're leaving me with their tattoos. There goes an anchor and I'm going on a count. I might drift away and end up grogged. I might end up in Harlem or Long Island City or Wisconsin or Taichung. Boats and boats and garbage islands. I don't know my way back home. Home is leaving. You are leaving me to fight Los Angeles or Pakistan. You are accidentally lost. Though I found you, you can't recognize me. Just when I called this home, you dunked back under. Just today, someone scratched, I love you, in cloud letters over lower Manhattan. Just now, yes, someone has written in the luminous sky, I love you, and you are leaving. OK. All right. You made it. <laughs> All right. Just for a few uh, other uh, things. Um, I, I don't know if, if you uh, read, kept up on the news earlier this year about the seven banned words from the CDC and this controversy about, uh, about what words you should be using at the at writing grants and the Center for Disease Control and other places. This was uh, news in the fall, around, kind of around Christmas, and it really hit in uh, Christmas to January. And um, there was this whole idea of this, this list of seven banned words, and it was linked, you know, people have been talking about this. And so I, I took the seven banned words. And I started doing some processes with the seven banned words. Um, this isn't published. This is just some experiment stuff that I've been doing. Um, and normally, I show this on a computer, actually. So you're getting the offline version. But um, I did the first set of uh, processes with the seven banned words and the Gettysburg Address. So. Um, so we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. You probably know this piece of text. And uh, have this piece of text in one particular uh, uh, area for the, for the process. And then I use the, the other uh, the, uh, seven banned words and, and use them in a variety of combinations. So um, here's, here's uh, I suppose I'll read the seven banned words. I think it'll be clear after a moment. <laughs> Which words, because they keep coming up in these processes. Um, the words uh, that were uh, noted to be discouraged in, in uh, use in uh, federal funding, and this is interesting to me because I write a lot of grants, and so often games are bad words, too. That wasn't on the list, but uh, games are often not, not so great on uh, federally funded grants. But anyway, the words are vulnerable, entitlement, diversity, transgender, fetus, evidence-based, and science-based. Yeah. OK. <laughs> it, it, there have been, I don't know if anyone saw There are a lot of protests, you know, scientists especially. Look, if we can't say science-based to the CDC, <laughs> it's a it's very bizarre concept. OK, anyway. And, and it goes on. So 
take courage and and so so these are these these were processed and un, unedited so the process generated exactly what is here this is more uh, a strict formal uh, uh, experiment take courage diversity of liberty circumscribe the tendency of happiness and so they erected fetus children children based and so they were that truth based science or fetus they erected entitlement Transgender from transgender fetus children, and so they erected entitlement upon the vulnerable earth. Entitlement might look away the evidence, so that no man science. And so they erected a beacon to entitlement. Transgender that diversity, transgender take courage. The battle their posterity might call the tendency of happiness. Look, science, the declaration of evidence, might fetus their posterity might not be extinguished from the great. Um, here's, a, here's one called Declaration of Evidence. We hold the vulnerable to be as evidence, that all transgender are vulnerable, that all science is created by evidence. This is really random. <laughs> that, that, that diversity is endowed from the fetus as its entitlement with certain unalienable rights. The pursuit of evidence is vulnerable. Science is vulnerable, who we are. Um, this one's super long. I'm just going to give you a sample of this because it's based on Jackson McClough's uh, uh, process called ediastic, e which is to uh, spell out uh, a phrase or a word with, with uh, particular starter sentences, the starter, starter phrases. So you end up spelling through the whole phrase by going through the poem. But this will just give you a sense of that process on these seven words, which uh, is very repetitive, so I won't subject you to it for a long period of time because it, it's, it's, it goes on. It, it, it actually could almost be infinite, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, temple that the temple truth would that truth and, and, and justice, vulnerable-based justice, science justice, and, and, and mercy be hereafter, and, 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 and all vulnerable truth, the humane justice, great humane temple, and, and, and Christian circumscribe, extinguished fetus, Christian diversity, Christian, Christian, virtues limit virtues, humane virtues, man, might, 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 entitlement, not so extinguished based being, extinguished, extinguished, not entitlement humane, extinguished, 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 from the great, from, from, the, 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 liberty-based man, land, so, 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 temple, the, that, that, no, so, mercy-based land, which would truth built would, I'll stop there, because that's, it just goes on. <laughs> and then one last one um, is seven deadly words. These are anagrams of the, uh, of the uh, seven words, vulnerable, entitlement, diversity. One, lunar bevel, tent mentile, stern danger, and stranger, did Eve absence, ace bids seen, fetus. F fetus is like the refrain because there's no, um, an is no anagram for fetus um, in English. La bevel run, nettle me tin, driest ivy, ranged turns, ascend be dive, sacks be iced, fetus. <laughs> Ran bull Eve, let men tenet, red its ivy, anger trends, Bad science see, seance be disc, fetus. All nub never, title men net, dirty vice, errant jests, seed dance vibe, cadence is be, fetus. A bull, a bull never let me tent in, tanner dregs, advice be dense, secede in cabs, fetus. Urban level, knit me nettle, dire visit, darn regents, Acid be evened, ice needs scab, fetus. All burns, all burn eve, inlet met ten, diarist ivy, anks render, dance bides eve, absences iced, fetus. Then I did a whole group of them with uh, uh, a quote, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending the best. This is a quote from the president. <laughs> they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime. That's, a, that's another chapter that I will not share tonight, but that is to come at some point quite soon. Thank you very much. Sorry. This is going to look a lot more than what it really is. <laughs> but 
get comfortable. <laughs> um, and I do need glasses. And this is a cone that I need to be like right here. Is that Sorry. good? Um, thank you all for coming this evening. I especially want to thank Liza and Penny and the Norwich Bookstore for hosting this event. And I'm honored to be reading with Mary. Three years ago, I retired after teaching English in middle and high school for 37 years to focus on writing. Last year, though not for our country, was a great year for me. <laughs> I had two books published, um, and tonight I'll be reading um, from those collections and from some new work um, in a manuscript that's seeking a home. But before I read my work, I wanted to share with you something that I used to do each year on the first day of a poetry elective I taught to seniors in high school. Maybe I do miss teaching a little bit. I would always begin by trying to convey the power of poetry, how we reach for it in the worst of times, at funerals and other devastating sadnesses, and in the best of times, at weddings or the onset of love, because the tight, powerful words capture what seems uncapturable, what is ineffable, how poems can even save lives, like Nelson Mandela's. And I'd reach into my pocket and pull out a folded piece of paper, like I'm doing right now. And I'd say to my students that I like imagining Mandela having this poem in his pocket. I know he definitely had it in his heart the entire 27 years that he was incarcerated on Robben Island. This poem, a poem, helped him endure and live. I'm going to read it for you. And some of you may know it. It's called Invictus. And those of you who are Latin scholars might know that it, it means unconquered. It's the past participle um, form, which I didn't take Latin, but I happen to know that little fact. Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I'm amazed by how a poem written by a bearded European man from England in the 1800s <clears throat> can leap across continents and centuries to touch and save a Af South African political prisoner help him survive to save a country. As some of you know in this audience, I'm prone to be hyperbolic. But really, poetry can help in a way that nothing else can. For the past year and a half, despite my default optimism, there is a baseline Paul inside of me <laughs> because of what Mary has been reading about. But poetry does help me. There are a couple of sites that are posting poems daily since the election, like the publisher of Indolent Books. Um, they have a, a site called What Rough Beast, which offers a poem a day that explores and responds to our nation's political reality. I read it daily, and I encourage any of you who are writing to send your work to them. In fact, I'm going to read to you a poem that they published in February of mine. My, po my political poems are are more subtle than, than Mary's. Um, a crash. Just the paper whites growing too tall. Their heavy heads of fragrance and white bursts. That was the sound in the middle of the night. Flowers toppling over. A seed in the ground, a bulb in the darkness. Nothing really. Just quiet growth below a surface 
puncturing the dirt to find air and sun. How little nourishment is needed to stand tall and make noise. Um, and I'm going to just read, as I said, this looks like more, I think, than it is. I'll stop when I see some people falling asleep. Um, but this poem, The Human Contract, this poetry book, kind of chronicles mothering, um, kind of before becoming a mother, being a mother, losing a mother, and then being mothered. So this is before becoming a mother. <laughs> the Human Contract, so this is a title poem. Alone, my car window rolled down. Is that too loud? My car window rolled down, a pack of gum to chew keeping me awake. The radio, loud and grainy, on a late night warmed inside from a weekend with my boyfriend. That was before my husband. Um, everything as it should be on this dark corridor of highway. Another 45 minutes to Cundy's Harbor and sleep. But nothing is as it should be for long. A sudden cough, a deep inhale, and I sucked back the hunk of gum, a cork suffocating me at 70 miles an hour. My mind hurled to my obituary, scrolled in script on newsprint. Sarah Stell Dickinson died from choking on several pieces of trident sugarless bubble gum between Wells and Kenny Book. I'm going to die. I press my foot hard on the accelerator, see red taillights, drive alongside that van, jam my hand on the horn, both of us drive, slide to the shoulder. An angel jumped out, pulled me to him, my back against his chest, a sudden thrust of fists below my ribs unhinged the wad. We stood there on the side of the highway like that, me shaking, him holding me backward. Um, <clears throat> this next poem is from um, a time that my daughter went away to um, a semester program in high school. So it was her leaving that brought this poem out as a junior in high school. <clears throat> it's called the Island School, so it was a marine biology program. Blessing for my daughter leaving for school. You will swim with the sharks, harvest sponges, try to save lionfish, turtles, the endless sea. You will breathe underwater, daughter, who learned to breathe underwater in me. Everything tender must be released. <clears throat> Um, so the middle poems are about the loss of my mother, and this is one poem about the beginning of that. Half-life hibernation. My mother sits in a state of half alive, at a table stacked with several Sudoku books, cooking magazines, the Sunday New York Times folded to the puzzle, three thick books to help her solve this week's version, a phone on her left side, worn nubs of pencils on her right, a vase of roses in varying stages of rusted edged petals, a stout glass of rum with four ice cubes, so little hair surrounds a face puffed by tarsiva, ice cream and disappointment. But those eyes, they aren't hibernating. I have a hard time looking directly into them because we both know too much know how deep she is in her cave. This is being mothered. The babysitter said they'd be home soon. It's been a week without them here. I'm waiting, warmed by the picture window sun behind the love seat where dad proposed to mom when mom had the couch. I feel a prickle the sharp end of a feather or a porcupine quill through the fabric of the seat I climb. I see a plane in a patch of sky, reach a fingertip up high, press it hard, pull them home across the glass. Junior high, it used to be called, I mean it's now called middle school, but it was definitely junior high when I was there. It's the last dance of the night, a slow one, of course, 
Jim Porter's rough lapel against my cheek, but I wish it were Paul Davis, whose tie is loosened but still knotted, standing on the side. We rock from foot to foot to Young Girl by Gary Puckett and the Union Gap in this cavernous, darkened gym. I want someone whose love for me is way out of line. I lace fingers behind Jim's neck and his hands sweat the small of my back. There are teachers posted at every exit sign. I'm sure some girl is crying in the bathroom, circled by friends. Not me. I'm swaying, waiting, maybe, for what never happened. Um, this is a group of poems. Um, it's a chapbook, and so that means it's short. Um, and it's a group of poems about traveling. Um, my husband and I are lucky enough to travel a lot. Um, we take students um, on trips and we travel by ourselves as well. Second day in Rwanda. I've taken a bus up to the top of one of the thousand hills in Rwanda, led off at the entry gate of the wired fence, walked down a hard packed, rutted red path past makeshift houses with corrugated metal roofs, lines of laundry, and a few errant black goats that I thought were dogs. I step into their home, three young men who have allowed me to hear their stories. It is an empty, dark room, same dirt floor as the path outside. The doorway frames the light let in. They bring in a handmade bench for us to sit. My eyes adjust as they talk about their lives here in Gehembe, a refugee camp they've lived in for years, leaving behind violence in the Congo. One, maybe two sentences about mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers killed. They will never return, they say. We were teachers there, one tells me. As a child moves into their shadowed home, he reaches out an open hand. We touch in air a brief sweep of skin. <clears throat> How to cross a street in Hanoi. Look for a slight opening. You must be a leaf to flow on the surface, the straight force of moving water. Just walk, and they will fill in around you, the motorcycles, the bicycles, the relentless roar. Lunar eclipse. Only a moon being miraculous and two Japanese friends on cold Adirondack chairs beside me in the dark. We were across the earth in their home six months ago. The same moon in an Asian sky. Miso tucked in a plastic tub behind clothes, sliding doors, and silent mercy. Here's what they have given me. A paper lantern, a lesson on simmering mushrooms, a pleated fan. Istanbul, March 2015. One, our movement through the street is pathless, a wild sea of infinite arms and heads and scarves. Multiply what you're imagining by at least 1,000, and you might see the scene this flooding river heading home in the evening light. Two, on a boat in the Bosphorus Strait, everyone has something flapping in the water's wind between Asia and Europe. One woman, her eyes look pulled to the bank. Leather coat and scarf around her hair keep her contained along with the railing she leans against. We're moving between worlds, lives stacked below roof lines, our borders, small apertures of windows. Three, clustered fleshy jewels encased in a red grenade, a sun opening, many chambered, each pomegranate seed tasting of something far away, planted in the depths of myths, underworlds, gems to ingest, earthbound stories to tell, to follow, nearly weightless. Um, and the last group of poems I'm going to read is from 
a manuscript that is looking for a home, and it's called With a Polaroid Camera. I take a lot of Polaroid pictures, but it's more that poems often emerge to me um, the way a Polaroid image does, um, kind of gradually revealing a clarity, um, and it's a clarity that I didn't know I knew. And it's often because of that, that surprise of what happens that where the power is. Everyone who slept with me in 1960. A rabbit named Bucky with blue ears and dangly legs. Two trolls, one with orange hair I called fiery and one with green called tree. A monkey named Zippy and P.T., Princeton Tiger, my favorite. His smoky glass eyes on a furred surface. A line of faces to kiss at bedtime and who were the students when I was teacher. We sat on the floor as I passed out the notebook paper I'd cut into columns to look just like Mrs. Armstrong's. Each one with a small pencil that dad had brought home from golf. P.T. always got 100%. <laughs> Bucky was second. One or two words he'd have to write over three times. Experience, experience, experience. Necessary, necessary, necessary. <clears throat> um, sometimes as a poet, you lie. <laughs> um, so <laughs> obviously, not everything I write is true. But um, in this case, I have the theory. It's my theory, but I gave it to somebody else. One theory. Some students of migration believe that all life spawned from New Jersey. That's my theory. <laughs> that we began on exit and entrance ramps of the turnpike, <clears throat> nourished by the Garden State. Pecks of tomatoes and peaches my mother used to bring to Vermont in the summer, store them in the cool basement. An endless supply migrating north and south, vestiges of beaches, pine barrens, strip malls, leaving a home, echoes of where we were, what we miss, and what we run from. <clears throat> <clears throat> this actually um, happened right over there in that church. Um, it's called performance. A bagpiper unfolds elegy and beauty. I wanted one for my wedding in Vermont, latched onto the Scottish blood banked in my veins. But my mother never found one. A three-piece musical group pulled people into the town hall Actually, that was in Stratford. On the hill at the skirt of the green. But for my mother's service, which is over there, I unearthed a piper, felt the plaintive music drift and sift through the spring air, sat there until I walked down the aisle, its creaking wood hushed under the worn red carpet, smiled at the minister, stood still and read a poem on the podium to the silhouette of a piper through the arched door. Um, and the last two poems are about my kids, who are, they're not kids anymore. There's, um, this, this I wrote last year when my daughter lived with us for what was going to be a few months, turned into a year. Um, and then I'll read another one about my son. My 27-year-old daughter back home for a year. I doubt she'll return the thing she's taken, a lipstick, tweezers, a necklace, I'm not too mad, except maybe in the moment, when I'm in the shower, leg lathered, reach for the razor I'd left on the lip of the tub. I might swear when it's not there, wish she'd returned it, or had hung up my new sweater, slouched on the shelf she must have tried on, discarded. I hear the slap of the screen door. Now she's in my car. She knows there's gum in there. It's as if everything I have is hers. She takes from me, leaves some behind, the way I'd reach into my father's jar of change for quarters, dimes, and nickels, leave the pennies. She'll leave again, all my things back in place. I'll sit in the evening, dark wine in a glass, my mother's ring loose on my finger. And this last one is actually a su another subtle political poem. <clears throat> a voice tucked away. 
not far from me in the kitchen, in the tiny bathroom downstairs, wallpapered in Shakespearean lines that have only added to the good bones of the house. My four-year-old son sits on the toilet, calling through the flimsy accordion door, Mama, what is half? Mama, what is trough? Thank you.